Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. We appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us. Um, today, we are going to be talking about medical records as they relate to minors and young adults. Uh, we were hopeful that this topic would be timely with uh, the return to school, although uh, we understand that there are some uh, challenges with returning to school, but nonetheless, we hope that you will find this information uh, beneficial to you today. Um, as Kathy mentioned, this webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording once it is over. Um, we do have a pod there that says files. It is on the left-hand side of your screen. The resources that we have for you are there. You can click on and highlight each one of those files, and then it will say download file. Uh, the presentation is there as well, so feel free to download those at your convenience and um, use them as you see fit. Uh, there's also a Q&A pod. If you have a question, please feel free to write your question in the Q&A pod that is on the bottom left of the screen, and we will answer any questions at the end of the presentation. Today, um, the presentation is with myself, Cassie Turner. I'm a senior risk management representative in the TMLT risk management department. And I also work with uh, Kathy in her department of products and development doing some uh, HIPAA consulting work. And Kathy is going to be joining us, and I'll let her introduce herself. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kathy Bryant. I'm the manager of TMLT's product development and consulting services. We work with physicians and their practices every day on HIPAA compliance and other forms of compliance. If you ever have a question, you can reach out to us either individually or uh, at the consulting at tmlt.org email address that will be shared again at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Kathy. So physician practices see, treat, and receive requests for medical records of children and young adults every day. So how do you feel whenever you get these requests in your practice? Do you feel that you are equipped and have the information that you need to release the medical records appropriately? Or do you feel a little overwhelmed, um, not quite sure uh, what you may need to release medical records and to whom? Um, so that's what we're going to talk about. Today we're going to discuss the challenges that medical practices face when releasing medical records of young children and adults. We'll talk about authorization versus right of access, and we will talk about laws regarding release of medical records, and we will talk about form and format of those release of medical records when you do release them. So we have a poll for you guys as we jump in and get started here. Do you require a written authorization from a parent when they request copies of their child's medical record. I'll give you guys a couple of minutes. So Kathy, it looks like the overwhelming majority of folks do require a uh, written authorization whenever a request is put for medical records, which is good. <laughs> That's great. We want to start this afternoon with an important um, point for our discussion today. It is what exactly is an authorization? An authorization under both HIPAA and Texas law is permission to voluntarily provide the information requested either to uh, to a, a different party or individual. As you know, covered entities are defined by Texas under the uh, Medical pra Privacy Act and under HIPAA, and they require that covered entities must obtain signed authorizations from the individual 
are they individual legally authorized to represent the, uh, the patient to electronically disclose protected health information. This change in Texas law brought about the form that you see on the right hand side. And the Texas Attorney General actually developed this form a number of years ago. It is the third downloadable file on the files pod, or pod on the left hand side. When the Attorney General produced this form, they made it clear that you don't have to use this form, but if you choose to, you should know that it complies with HIPAA, the Texas Medical Privacy Act, and other applicable laws. The right to access medical records is under the privacy rule or HIPAA privacy rule that requires covered entities to provide individuals upon request access to their protected health information. It also talks about an individual having the right to access their PHI and that right lasts for as long as the information is maintained by the covered entity. I think most people know the rule about you have to maintain your records for seven years, uh, except with minors, which is seven years after they become adults or seven years from the last visit. But if you have electronic records, which most practices do, that rule really doesn't hold true anymore because most of those records are going to be maintained forever. And so as long as you maintain the records, you are going to be required to provide them upon request. Now, one of the things about an individual's right to their medical records is that you cannot create an undue burden on the individual, or in this, in the case of minors, uh, the parents, when they request medical records. This is just an example of a simplified version of a request form when a patient requests their medical records or parents. I think most of us have read Chapter 165 of the Texas Medical Board Rules. Just as a quick reminder, the Texas Medical Board rules do address that the release of records is pursuant to a written request. That means in Texas, the Texas Medical Board requires that you get a written consent. I'm sorry, a written request, uh, not a consent. Of course, you have 15 days to provide those medical records in Texas. And there are a number of other record-related topics that are also covered in Chapter 165 that aren't really uh, pertinent to today's presentation. So what are the requirements in Texas for a written authorization to release medical records? Well, first, it has to be in writing. It has to be signed by the proper person with the authority to make the request, and the requirements um, must be there for validity or to validate that it is a, the obvious or the person requesting the records, the reason for the release, and to whom the records are to be released. We've already talked about the rec or the uh, form that the Texas Attorney General produced. So here's our second polling question. Are there exceptions that allow the physician to withhold records of a child from the parent? I'll give you just a minute to ask, answer that. Cassie, it looks like we're running about 50-50. Um, yes, there are exceptions. 
So yeah, Kathy, as you mentioned, um, there are some exceptions and those are outlined here for you uh, in this Texas Code um, and the Texas Administrative Code 165.2. So when there is no valid authorization, as Kathy has explained, um, unless required by law, then the physician can refuse to release those medical records. Also, if the physician feels that by releasing the records it would create harm um, to the patient, then they can use professional judgment to withhold those records um, if it's harmful physically, mentally, or emotionally. And then the third um, exclusion there is when a physician can remove information um, that's confidential about another patient or family member um, of that patient who has not consented to the release of the information. And again, um, a valid consent for disclosure of minors must be signed by the parent or guardian. The exceptions for that if it's been um, a court emancipation of the minor or if the minor is married. Otherwise, it must be signed by the parent or guardian. Um, some quick laws here about Texas, and just so that everybody, we get this question a lot in our risk management department, what is the age of majority in Texas? Texas recognizes 18 as the age of majority, um, and someone who is a resident is legally considered an adult here in Texas. Um, if a minor would like to be emancipated, there are some guidelines that they must follow to be emancipated. It's typically someone who is 17 or 16 uh, living apart from their parents and they're able to support their own affairs. Uh, there are some things that they must uh, include in their, peti their petition whenever they go before the court to try to get emancipation and those are listed here for you as well. Their name, age, residency, um, residency of parents and guardians or managing conservator if applicable, reasons why the emancipation serves their best interest and then the purpose for the request. So verbal request, um, HIPAA recognizes oral requests for access and copies of records as binding unless the patient has been informed requests must be in writing. As Kathy has mentioned, Texas requires a written consent. So you'll want to ensure that your policies and procedures require a written consent and that that's documented very clearly. And you'll also want to ensure that that's included in your HIPAA notice of patient privacy so that the expectation and the requirements are very clear to the patient. And just as a little tip here, you can add this language if you do not already have it included, just stating we require all requests for release of medical records um, to be in writing. So we have another polling question for you here. Let's say you receive a phone call for requests of medical records of your patient, Joseph, from his mother. She tells you that he has recently started attending Harvard and she wants to know when he had the HPV vaccination. What should you do? So comply with the request. Remind Joseph's mother that Joseph is 18 and must consent to her receiving a copy. Uh, send the copies on to Harvard or contact Joseph and request an authorization to release records. We'll give you guys a couple of seconds to answer that. So it looks like a split between remind Joseph's mom that he is 18 and contact Joseph uh, for a request, both of which are correct answers to uh, this question. It wasn't meant to be a trick question, but both of those do apply in that Joseph is 18 and that he can also provide a request to authorization for that release. So Cassie, if someone has a health care board of attorney for an individual, can they access an individual's medical records? Yes, they can to um, an extent access those records. Um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, with physicians do have 
uh, medical judgment that they can use if they feel it would be harmful uh, to the patient or if the minor has been subject to some type of domestic violence, abuse, or neglect. In those cases, the physician can use their professional judgment um, and not release the records if they feel that it is in the best interest of the individual. So yes and <laughs> a little bit of a caveat there. Can a personal representative of an adult or emancipated minor obtain access to an individual's medical record? Generally, yes, they can. However, um, it's important to know the scope of the access and to identify if that scope is limited anyway, in any way. Um, and in this example here, it talks about um, the decision for life support. That can be limited within an access. So if it is a limitation, you'll want to make sure that only information that is pertinent to that decision is provided um, to the individual. Otherwise, healthcare decisions generally can be made and access can be given if there's no limitations put on it. Does the HIPAA privacy rule give parents the right to see their children's medical records? Yes, they do. And we get this question again often in our risk management department. Um, there are instances when a minor um, can cons consent to their own treatment, and we will cover that later in the presentation. Um, generally, however, th there are some exceptions. They are here. Uh, if a minor who consents to care and the consent of the parent is not required under state law, however, in Texas, we've just discussed how it is required here, um, or if a minor is at the care of a court, and the court has appointed um, someone to uh, get a test or something like that, then that would be a different scenario. Um, and then to the extent that the parent and minor have an agreement for a confidential relationship. We do see this very, uh, not very common, but we do see where parents will say they give their uh, minor child confidentiality in a relationship, um, which we're not sure how It sounds like Cassie may be having some challenges with her audio, so I will wait. I'll just pick up till she comes back. Oh, she's back. Sorry about that. Technology is being difficult today. <laughs> So parents still have access, as we mentioned, there are some exceptions, and those are included here in this um, uh, blurb from HHS. However, uh, again, it references professional judgment, which we've talked about a couple of times, um, that the physician does have if they feel there would be harm created to the individual or to the minor, that the professional judgment can be used to withhold those records. Um, so that... I would encourage if you do have these types of scenarios that you just make sure that you have really good documentation as to rationale for not releasing those medical records. So Kathy, does the HIPAA privacy rule address when someone may not be the appropriate person to control an individual's protected health information? Generally speaking, HIPAA does not address when it's inappropriate for someone to access or be in control of the records. That's generally left up to the state because especially with minors, that falls under the family codes and, and those do vary from, from uh, state to state. But as, as we've discussed several times, there are some judgment calls when a personal representative might not be appropriate to access the records. So if a child receives emergency medical care without a parent's consent, can the parent obtain all information about the child's treatment and condition? Very simply, yes. The parent has a right to access the medical records, even if they did not consent to the treatment. This is a question that we often get, particularly related to uh, situations where parents are divorced and 
one parent may take a, a child in for some sort of treatment and the other parent then wants the records that is, uh, that is allowed unless that right to receive those records has been re removed by the courts. So does HIPAA provide uh, rights for children to be treated without a parental consent? Actually, no. HIPAA really relates to privacy and keeping those records private. It does not address consent to treatment. That, again, is going to be specific by state. So, Kathy, we mentioned earlier that we were going to talk about who can consent for the treatment of minors. So, uh, can you tell us who in the state of Texas is allowed to consent for treatment of minors? Sure. In Texas, the law asserts that all parents have a duty to provide medical and dental care to their children. Therefore, it gives them the right to consent. Now, there are going to be some cases. Um, specifically thinking about divorce, when both parents generally maintain that right to consent unless the courts have limited the rights of one or more one or both of the parents. Texas law does not require consents in emergency circumstances in which it's not possible to obtain consent from the parent. There are circumstances when those parents or the parent cannot be located. And generally, this is the, the list of people who can give consent. A grandparent, an adult brother or sister, an adult aunt or uncle, any educational institution in which the minor is enrolled and has written, they have written authorization from the parents. Uh, providing consent power, or any adult who has actual control, care, or possession of a minor. So if, for instance, uh, a, a friend leaves their children with a, an adult friend for a weekend and the child needs to be seen in a medical facility, that can be done without contacting the parents uh, if the parents are not available. One last thing that we wanted to talk about is when minors can actually consent for themselves. This is actually from a source called Adolescent Health, a guide for providers that is a Texas Department of State Health Services doc, uh, publication. And that document is the third document on the files list that is available for download. You may find this very helpful if you treat um, adolescents in your practice. So the thing, the times that a minor can consent to treatment is if they are uh, in active duty with the armed services, if they're 16 or older and reside apart from their parents, managing conservator, a guardian and are managing their own fiscal affairs. If they're unmarried and pregnant, they can consent to treatment related to the pregnancy other than abortion. If the minor is unmarried and the parent of a child and has custody of that child, then they may consent to the treatment for the infant or, or, or the child. A minor can consent to the diagnosis and treatment of infectious, contagious, or communicable diseases that are reportable to the Texas Department of State Health Services. A minor can also consent to the examination or treatment for chemical addiction, dependency, or other conditions directly related to chemical use. And lastly, a minor can consent for counseling for suicide prevention, chemical dependency or addiction, or for sexual, physical, or emotional abuse. So Kathy, when a patient reaches the age of majority, 
uh, which is 18 in the state of Texas, or becomes emancipated, who controls their PHI for health care services that were delivered while the patient was still a minor or unemancipated? Actually, the emancipated minor or the adult now passing the age of majority is now in control of their records. So if a parent were to try to access those records, um, you would either need to get a consent or, or from the adult or emancipated patient, or you would need to deny the request. So does the HIPAA privacy rule allow a healthcare professional to disclose PHI about a student to a school nurse? You know, this is where HIPAA and state laws sometimes get a little tricky. Because technically, the answer to the question is yes. The HIPAA privacy rule allows a covered entity to disclose PHI about students to school nurses or other health care providers at the school for treatment purposes without authorization from the student's parent. Examples of that are if the primary care the primary care physician may discuss a student's medication or other health care needs with a school nurse uh, if the school nurse is going to be administering that medication. Additionally, the health care provider may disclose proof of immunizations directly to the school. There's, but just a little word of caution. You know, we said several times Texas requires a written authorization or a written request to release records. So out of an abundance of caution, it is probably best to try to get a written uh, uh, consent or request from the parent. And if it truly can't wait for the time of a, a consent or a written request to come in, you can take a verbal request and document it in the medical record. So can a healthcare professional disclose proof of immunization directly to the school without authorization? Just kind of covered that on the last slide. And so yes, it is uh, possible, but again, out of an abundance of caution in Texas, it's best to make sure that you try to obtain that written request or make not notation of the oral request from a parent uh, in the medical record. And what kind of, what type of documentation of parental agreement is required to permit disclosure of immunizations and how long do they need to maintain this documentation? Well, HIPAA provides a very long answer to that question, Cassie. Um, but basically, HIPAA does not prescribe the form or format that you must maintain documentation of those types of requests. However, in Texas, again, we strongly encourage you to get a written request, even if it is a request sent through your patient portal um, or email, if you have an option for patients or parents emailing you, to get that request in writing. And for all documentation that's related to HIPAA, it must be maintained for six years. However, as you know, medical records requirements for the amount of time you must keep those records, especially for minors, far exceed six years. So another poll question for you guys. After a divorce, only the custodial parent has a right to the records of the, the minor. And I'll get this expanded here. Yes, always. Yes, with a few exceptions. No, only with consent of parent who carries insurance. So a little bit of a split um, between uh, yes and no. So 
So it really it depends after a divorce what um, rights the parent has and what the court has outlined. Um, get back to that slide so sorry uh, the Texas Family Code provides that unless limited by the court order a parent appointed as a conservator managing or possessory of the child has at all times the following rights so they have the right to access the medical and dental uh, psychological and educational records of the child um, so if the court has labeled them as these then yes they do again you'll want to verify that that's how they are addressed from the court's perspective So if you've joined us for previous uh, webinars, you've probably heard us talk on, a dip on several occasions about patients, and in this case, parents, having the right to receive their records in the form and format they desire. If your practice uses or maintains an electronic health record, the parent or patient have the right to obtain that information in a, an electronic format. Sometimes that means they want them by email. Sometimes they want them in an electronic form, such as on a CD or by email. Um, sometimes you can push the records out electronically through your portal. And we still do see patients requesting records on paper. So we have one final poll in question that we'd like you to uh, answer if you would about do pa parents have a right to their child's medical records and they do not need to complete a written medical records request. It looks like the majority of people do not think or, or say no that uh, a record, a written record request is needed. And of course, we've stressed that more than once in this webinar. So, what's the impact of noncompliance? Like so many things with HIPAA and Texas uh, law. You run the risk of Texas Medical Board investigations if someone files a complaint, if you do not appropriately provide medical records. People can also complain to the Federal Office for Civil Rights, um, who are the HIPAA enforcement arm of Health and Human Services. These investigations take time away from patient care to deal with the investigation. There can be financial impacts, both the uh, additional expenses as well as loss of revenue. And unfortunately, there are fines and penalties that can be assessed by those entities as well. I'd like to turn this open up for questions. Um, at this point, looks like we have a few questions, Cassie. Yes, we do. So I receive phone calls at least once a month from different entities requesting medical records without written authorization. Uh, how do I handle this? If that person, if it's the uh, an entity that's requesting the records, if they're providing care to the patient and you can verify that, then you can easily uh, provide those under the exception that does not require an authorization of treatment, uh, providing the records for treatment or ongoing treatment 
under the treatment payment and healthcare operations part of HIPAA. So what about charging uh, a fee for those records, Kathy? Well, this is probably one of the hottest topics out there. If it's to another institution, generally we do not see people charging to provide records to another physician or another uh, practice. Um, we have a whole webinar that's recorded and is available on hub.tmlt.org that talks about charging for medical records that might go into uh, the, the information you're looking for. Cassie, are there any additional specific exceptions such as STI test results and can you address those? Um, I'm assuming as far as minors being able to consent for their own treatment, um, if they can consent to diagnosis and treatment of infectious, contagious, and communicable diseases that are reported to the Texas Department of State Health Services. Um, so uh, those are the primary ones where they can consent and have um, the ability to get treatment without the uh, consent of their parent. What about releasing those results to the parent if the parent requests? say, a copy for all medical records? If uh, Typically, um, what we've been, uh, we say that those can be withheld, those results. Um, be, oftentimes, we know that the parent will be able to find some of that information just from an insurance EOB, uh, but those results can be withheld from the patient's medical chart if the parent is asking for a copy. What type of language, language be in a refusal to release records from a patient? Um, you want to document why you believe those records should be withheld. And there is specific information um, in HIPAA that talks about how you should go about releasing um, notifying the patient you're not going to re release that information. If you'd like a little more information on that, if you'll email us at the consulting at tmlt.org, it's uh, this email right here in the, the center of your screen. Um, we'll send you some more information about that. So Kathy, do you recall, or are there um, expanded consent for vaccines that you are aware of? I don't know what you're talking, uh, the specific expanded consent for vaccines specifically. There is the uh, vaccine uh, information sheet that is required under federal law that must be given to all parents and or patients if they are able to consent to their own treatment um, that that must be provided and you must document not only that you gave them that VIS as they're sometimes called or vaccine information sheet but you also have to document what edition of that sheet because those do change periodically. So Cassie, can a patient request their medical record via email instead of completing a form? Typically, yes. If We recommend that if a patient initiates a request um, from you to correspond via email that you document that you've discussed the risk um, to communicating via email and that they would, you know, take on that risk and want to move forward. Um, if 
you can ideally uh, email them the form and have them return it. Uh, that would be ideal, but if it's going to create a burden for them, then uh, you don't want to create a burden for them to be able to get their medical records. Um, but I, I would make sure that you have a copy of the email as well um, in the patient chart just to show that they did request this um, if you're not able to get an email form over to them and get it back. Uh, again, another question about email. Kathy, if you have anything to add as far as sending um, email when someone requests it, um, the only other thing I would add is if there's a portal and you can push those things to the portal, that would be another a uh, little bit safer way of going about it. So if you have, um, if a patient requests their records by email, you need to inform them if you do not have encrypted email then you need to inform them that the records can be sent to them, but that they are not being sent in a secure manner. If the patient insists that you send them in an unsecure manner, then you need to document that you've had the discussion about sending them in an unsecure manner and proceed with that. Um, some places actually have them have a, someone sign a consent that they agree to have the, the record sent in an unsecure manner. Can Child Protective Services get records for a child without a request? This happens often and I always make them send over a signed request. Cassie, that sounds like a frequently asked question in risk management. Yeah, we do get this question a lot, and I think that it's reasonable to ask them to send over a request to you, one, so that you can validate um, their identity. Again, if, they're, if the kiddo is in Child Protective Services, you will want to take some extra measures to make sure that you're releasing the information to the appropriate person. Um, obviously, CPS can access those records, but it's reasonable to ask for some validation of who they are. Uh, so, Kathy, if you give go ahead records to a parent of a child that was emancipated because we didn't know of the emancipation, what would happen in that scenario? I think that this is uh, one of the situations where some of the responsibility for lies on the child who has gained emancipation. Um, they they need to let their healthcare providers know that they have their their legal status basically has changed. That said, that doesn't mean that the child that's emancipated may not file a complaint with the Texas Medical Board or file a complaint with the OCR, which in either case might lead to an investigation um, under. HIPAA or the Texas Medical Board. So I, I think that's one of those situations where you're not wrong in doing it, but there may be, uh, there may be some situations where obviously there would be other questions that you would have to answer. So um, if you are having those situations frequently, that might be something you'd want to speak with an attorney about as well. So if so, a patient is deceased, can the parents have rights to medical records? And uh, as Kathy mentioned about fees, we have a great portion of a webinar that's dedicated to just uh, deceased records. So generally when a patient dies, their right to privacy does not um, die. So it would be whoever the court has appointed as the executor or, and in this case, most likely it would be the parent. And if the court has appointed that, then yes, there would be a right to those records. And Kathy, feel free to add. Uh, that would be exactly my answer. If a Texas provider makes a report to the Texas CPS who then passes along the information to an out-of-state CPS where the family is moving 
and the out-of-state CPS still needs to provide um, an ROI to receive information from the Texas reporting provider, correct? I would definitely say that if it's an out-of-state uh, CPS attempting to get information, I would definitely request something in writing. Um, I think that that would be the most prudent thing to do and and maintain any documentation of phone calls or any other kind of uh, contacts that you have with that out-of-state CPS office. So Kathy, yeah, see, PHI, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I think we are on the next question. PHI can be emailed. Any restrictions? I think that you've discussed um, this. Again, making sure that the p patient has requested this, that they understand that the information is not being sent, perhaps in a secure manner, and making sure that you've documented that. So sometimes parents request medical records and refuse to pay for them. Can we deny the request? Actually, uh, part of a, a discussion on the Health and Human Services HIPAA Frequently Asked website question, there is some information that just says OCR believes that it's so important that that patients, and in this case parents, have a right to the records, they believe that practices should provide them for free. However, if they refuse to pay for the records, um, if it's going to create a burden for them not to get those records simply for payment, the OCR is going to lean very heavily on you providing the records. Cassie, do you have any other thoughts on that? No, I agree with what you said. The next question is, should we release records to 16 and 17 year olds that schedule their own appointments, drive themselves to appointments, and generally facilitate their own care? Um, if they are asking for copies of their medical records, then I believe for 16 and 17 year olds who do not fall into any of those uh, emancipation qualifications, uh, then they would need to have a, con or a, a request for the records signed by the parents. Now the parents may say something to the effect of please provide my son or daughter a copy of the record from that day or that type of thing, but they are not able to request records independently at 16 or 17 unless a specific circumstance applies. Do we need written consent from attorneys? I am not sure what this is in, oh, from attorneys to receive medical records. Um, typically, if the patient is wanting those records, then the patient can um, have their that submitted to, the, to you all, and you can release to the attorney of the, the parent uh, or the unemancipated or minor who can consent for their own treatment um, consents for that and they can submit a written consent. I don't know, Kathleen, you can chime on the, in on this, if I would just take a written consent from a, an attorney in risk. We have seen false documents um, that haven't been validated, so I would be a little bit cautious um, in just taking it directly from an attorney without validating it with a parent or the minor. Yeah, the the one thing that I was specifically thinking of when I read that question, Cassie, was especially 
it can get tricky in cases of divorce. And so um, obviously one parent may be consenting. So if you ever have any questions about that, reach out to your medical malpractice insurance carrier. They can help you sort through uh, written consent, specifically TMLT's claims department can help discern whether that written consent is, uh, is valid. But yes, I would say you have to have a written consent signed by the patient and or parent um, if it's a minor child. I have patients who refuse to allow me to share their charts with anyone. Is there a special document I need to have them filled out to protect them and me? Um, by anyone, I'm guessing that, that you're specifically asking about a, an individual person because obviously you don't have to have uh, documentation or you don't have to have um, authorization to release records for treatment payment or health care operations. That said, as far as documenting, most practices uh, that we've seen have some form that they have patients fill out as new patients and then at least generally on an annual basis that says who they can discuss their care with. Uh, if you need some examples of that, send us an email and we'll be happy to um, try to get you an example or two. Um, if, if they are verbally requesting it, then of course I would say definitely uh, document that in your records. So next question is, how do we handle a request from an unknown medical practice? Are we allowed um, some form of verification concern that it is not the medical office calling? I, I think it's absolutely reasonable and appropriate to get verification of who um, is requesting the records. You can also connect with the patient um, to see if they are moving, transitioning care, or they're going to see a specialist that you're not aware of and document their consent that they want those medical records uh, transfer to that particular provider, but yeah, I definitely would. Um, that would be make sure that um, that that is being done. There is a question about CME for today's program. Um, unfortunately, or not unfortunately, but this is something that we're getting a lot of more requests about, and so we are going to be offering uh, CME starting next month for selective uh, topics. Unfortunately, it was not approved for this topic today. If a parent requests medical records, but they owe our clinic money from a previous visit, are we required to provide the records regardless? Um, I believe that's pretty clear in, in HIPAA that you have to provide those medical records. You cannot withhold them for um, not paying a past financial obligation. See, Cassie, I think the last question is, we're a busy pediatric office and get tons of requests for shot records. If we confirm it with the parent requesting the shot record, can we accept the verbal request and email or fax shot records, or will we have to do this uh, request in writing as well? I believe um, with a proof of immunization that those can be sent directly to, in most cases, to the school without an authorization. I uh, would be cautious on using email and lean towards fax over email um, just because it's uh, hopefully a little bit more secure. Um, 
and I would also ensure that you're documenting the patient's request or the parent's request and um, that that's in the chart as well, showing that you've discussed that verbal request, the um, security issues associated with it, and, and making sure that that's documented. The only thing I would add to that is um, look at your, look into your, your patient portal because it may be possible for you to uh, have your immunization records pushed out to the portal automatically. And that would be very easy then for the parent to go in and retrieve those without having to go through your office every time. And so we would certainly encourage uh, the use of the patient portal because number one, it's secure. And number two, then that puts the burden of getting those records to wherever they need to go on, on the parent, uh, not on the patient, or, I'm, I'm not on the office. Cassie, it looks like that's um, all of the questions. Thanks everyone for joining the webinar. Um, really good questions. We always know that release of medical records is confusing and I would just um, remind you that TMLT's Risk Management Department does take questions every day. There is a risk management representative available to answer questions. Uh, they get lots and lots of them on our re release of medical records. You can also email those uh, specific questions to consulting at tmlt.org. And we hope that you uh, have a great rest of your week and uh, take care. And we'll hope to see you next month when the webinar will be managing your online presence. Uh, we think this is going to be a, a real interesting presentation by uh, an attorney and TMLT's uh, own Sarah Bergmanson, who does our digital and social media campaigns. So we look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks, everyone.